reaction which is happening in the reactor. Uh, we can think through multiple options as usual. And when that decision is being made, as a senior engineer, I should be updated. Like what decision I'm making, is it the right decision at this point in time? And then as a junior engineer as well, the junior engineer should keep posting things. Like say, dude, this is happening. Did you check this out? This is cooler. So that's the whole uh, thought process behind this talk. So, uh, okay. So create React app, we all know. Uh, it's just like a package runner. Uh, like there are a lot now. So this is one of the package renders which was like, uh, came from the initial React and things. So I have been in the industry or like, industry maybe like I completed my graduation in 2019 after that I'm in the industry, but uh, I, my first React experience was in like maybe 2016 or something during my second year when I just started. At that time, I don't know how many age old people are here. Like there was Grunt, Gulp, I don't know how many of you heard. New age people wouldn't have heard that, but yeah, uh, some oldies here maybe, yeah. <laughs> would have heard it. So yeah, so the, those would have been a nightmare. So when we got to know like create react, I was like crazy, like dude, you want command and then like your entire boilerplate is set up. You can just run it. Like it was crazy. That, that is a aha moment for all of these people who have been in that uh, 2016, 2017 time. Uh, basically I remember people running from react to view just to avoid this boilerplate setup. So uh, just consider I am doing a create react app today. What will be the decisions I'm going to do? This is going to be the talk. And I'm Santosh, I'm working for this company called One House. It's a universal data lake house. We'll see more about it. <clears throat> okay, so what this talk is going to cover and what it's not going to cover, right? So basically this are all design decision and mostly subjective, right? And there are, there are objective decisions most of the times, but there are a lot of things which are still subjective in this text. Uh, so whatever the debate arguments, we can take it after the talk. But if there is any doubts or if I missed any major decision, just like chime in, raise your hands, just ask, keep, keep asking questions, no worries here. So uh, React is the only thing I'm going to talk about. I'm not talking about any of the frameworks, given it's a React meetup. And I also don't know any of the framework in the front end. And it's a client side app. The reason being, again, most of my expertise has revolved around that. Uh, I have been in the B2B application development for like five years now. So B2Cs, I don't know. So most of the B2Bs I developed are also like, which doesn't require server-side rendering or something of that sort. So it is all cool. Like I have been dealing with only client side and most of my expertise lies there. So I'm giving you all the discussions only on that. And yeah. We are building it in 2025, strictly TypeScript, <laughs> nothing like uh, UMDMD modules. I'm going to stick with the ESM modules. Just keep it in mind that we are building it now and not four or five years before, right? So I'm just going to take the decisions based on what is the current scenario. And now uh, coming to the UI engineering, right? It's not like before. Uh, before it's like single ton, like both UI and uh, backend are developed by a single engineer, basically because there is no segregation. And then like the UI engineers and backend engineers came in where backend engineers do the most of the works and UI engineer will just write, uh, like take care of Figma to the HTML conversion part. But UI engineer is never like that, right? Now, at this point in time, it's a lot. So there are three major priorities. One is like the engineering priority, which is like to build the customer experience, the UX actually, the user experience. And the second one is like, while you're building the UX, as a senior engineer, if you're doing this Create React app, you need to make sure that your developers are high in performance and running at the highest productivity. So there comes the DevX, which is DX, like whatever you call it, developer experience. And then if there is somebody working on some mission critical application, like uh, working with super cool engineering team, like say 15, 20 UI engineers, and then there comes an on-call guy. So there is an on-call guy who is like, say, checking out for SaaS applications, like supporting, like what is the issues coming in. He is the op operator for your app for that entire week. <clears throat> His experience matters. So if you are not focusing on the OX, the operator experience, your on-call guy will be in trouble. He is on fire. The employees will ultimately leave the company because of low work-life balance. So if your operator experience is good, 
you can have better work life balance and things so this also matters a lot now getting to the next one which is like once you start this what is going to be the back end that's the first question a ui engineer is going to ask right back end is not under our control like they can build anything but for each and every type of back end we need clients in the ui right so it's not like the old age where we can just like have only one back end like rest apis just call it like you will use fetch calls and then done it's not like that and again fetch and axios has its own problems like say you need to maintain the urls in a single place and that will be duplicated and like say for example if the endpoint is changing in the back end and then you need to keep it updated and those are all a lot of trouble so the interesting part is like with this clients right like say for example if i have a rest api i am not going to allow my back end engineer to build some random rest api i would ask him to do open api standards dude at this point in time if you are not following open api standard if you are writing a rest api it's not good so follow open api standards what we are going to achieve with the open api standards we are going to get a contract so once you get the contract the stubbing becomes easier the scaffolding of the code like you know these are the contracts to call this endpoints these are the hooks i can get it so these kind of scaffolding you can do it so for rest api make sure your engineer back end engineer is writing open api standard so that you can make scaffolding on top so like graphql and grpc automatically like comes with this like contract strict a contract rest api is where most of the people like will just like play around or like say miss it out right so when it comes to graphql no doubts there is apollo and again you can use relay also on top but yeah apollo is only supporting a lot of relay features it is giving relay pagination and things so it's fine i i will stick with relay apollo just with apollo if you ask me and then if you talk about grpc there is grpc clients which you can use and especially connect query this is one interesting project which is like like getting a lot of uh interest nowadays check it out if anybody works on grpc man like graphql i think most people work but anybody working on grpc directly calling grpc no okay so it is also just like http two calls it's not http one call like rest apis will be mostly http one grpc will be http two graphql is can be like http one whatever so <clears throat> it depends on what is the proxy that you have so uh graphql we use it in a lot of placement how many people are using graphql now okay few few hands nice so this solves the overfetching underfetching problem but it's a big headache for the back end man like ask your back end engineers like they are going crazy because of graphql engineers if you are b2c if you are working on some uh application which needs very low latency which need need to address that underfetching overfetching problem you need to go with graphql or otherwise not so one of the previous docs which i work like say basically they were using graphql but ultimately they were not leveraging it right so you can use graphql but not leverage its features no point so basically like there is no problem of overfetching underfetching there like where we expect the user to be in a high internet environment so in that place you don't actually need to care about the payload size and things like that right so it's okay you can write a cleaner rest api that will take care of all these things but still we went with graphql for <coughs> some reasons but what it gave out of the box is this scaffolding which is already present in the rest api which i will stick with rest api for now if that is the case if i need to take the decision but grpc yeah so you based on your backend like if it is grpc use some client like graphql as apollo and on top relay and if it is rest api open api st standards just there are two projects i have mentioned one is like the react open api client which has like some uh, 20k stars or something like a cool project the second one is from harness uh, it's a company which is also having a, a place in bangalore so basically i just mentioned that like that is one of my friends who wrote that project check it out oats uh, so this is also a cool project what these clients are going to help you uh these are wrappers on top of react query i don't know how many of you have heard about react query it's just like some state management man you don't need to use like something like redux or something it will automatically give you the hooks from where you can get the data it's centralized so uh, entire app wherever you call it if the data is present in your cache it will throw you back so all these advantages you have so 
what are the backend clients if you are designing a backend client for http4 if it comes in the future right if you are a open source contributor if you are writing http4 what you need to consider code scaffolding when i give the contract it should give all the types generated and everything next one like it should give stricter contracts for sure then only it will give you code scaffolding with all the hooks created type safety and everything and then centralized state management it should be a centralized state across your app so that wherever you call it from you should be able to get it from the cache wherever it is and it should be a in memory caching present there should be a in memory caching present so that like say when i call the data let's consider like, i am getting a list of users with their names and ids it's not going to change like in within some time as far as in the b2b application right so at least for one user session they can stick with some obsolete data it's okay so or otherwise there is another one thing most of the clients will give you cache first approach where the cache will be loaded first but in the background there will be a network call going and then fetching in the fresh data and it will update the state so all these things are taken care by this backend client so definitely will recommend using any of the backend clients in any of the backends that you are using don't go ahead without any backend client that's mostly it. connect query as i mentioned just check it out this project this is also a cool open source project and next one okay react starts and ends with state what are the state management i'm going to do redux do you do that no so basically this dan promo this guy he is the one who built the redux and he will obviously like ask us to or influence to use redux but say for example it is also using context internally which is natively provided by react and it doesn't add you any more bundle space bundle size or something but the problem with the react context is like if at all a junior engineer comes into the picture like again a team consider a bunch of junior engineers some senior engineers and a manager that's how i see it and let's consider a junior engineer comes into the play and he doesn't know how to use context properly using context is fine using context properly is a thing like not a lot of people know that so if he does something and then the senior engineer didn't catch it up in the review goes to the production unnecessary a lot of re-renders will happen and that is where the redex will help you like it will give you some granular granular uh, subscription and things but end of the day it also adds up your bundle space, bundle size and again if you take the last one right which is like all the micro state management libraries like just and zotai vat valtio or what not uh, all these things gives you the exact same feature like uh, redex and context gives uh but with better redux you need not do that use reducer you need not write any side effects this that nothing this will take care of everything small easy hooks it's available and then you just create the hooks call it wherever you want across your app and it will give you fine grained granular subscription subscription publisher subscription model so basically these are going to be the ruling ones so if at all you are using so while as i mentioned right why you will use some state management to store some data what data it could be basically front end is two types of data one is like the user generated data whether he clicked there what is there in the form that the user is typing and things and there is second data which is coming from the back end for the back end data we already have the clients the back end clients so no other data is going to come to my state so what is the second thing i am going to have some forms or some user generated data which i can keep it in some normal use state only or if required i can go with something of this sort which is like smaller in bundle size better dx developer experience rather than using context or redux context has some security it's not security security thing but it's vulnerable for like for you to review there is a real lot of review efforts and a lot of things are there so it's better to go with something apart from context so redux comes into the picture but redux is heavy which is not required so we are going with uh micro state management libraries which are cooler now react query is one cool stuff try it out if you are not trying it out till now and uh, now we got two things sorted back end clients and the state management and the third one is design okay so now i am that guy like who loves to write css like damn bro i like go in and out in css i go i write houdini i write animations by myself i write everything by myself like in css 
like till like i complete my college i am that guy like no css in js i don't like it man like what does this stupid things like i will write css files i'll just import it in the index.html done completed i will add proper classes i will add proper uh, what do you call the priorities and everything in the css make sure my css files are clean so that uh, bundle sizes are smaller and things but once i come into like the place like where the high scale applications are built it is hard to restrict people to write some good code so basically it's people usually tend to write some uh, code due to some high velocity expectations from the manager or something of that sort so basically people tend to reduce the quality so in that case uh, the better way you can get the priority and all these things get it right in the uh, design with your css is very tough so that is where these uh, css and js libraries comes into the picture and then gives you out of the box all these things and then it will do tree shaking as well and then make sure uh, not like bundling a lot of css reduce your bundle size takes care of everything and uh, if you see there are two things one is like this nail polish like styled components and then there is another one which is this emotion so i prefer emotion basically because emotion is faster man that's it nothing else uh and uh, yeah don't forget to use this css variables even though i am writing css and js i leverage a lot of css and js uh, like css variables reason being it doesn't re-render your app like so just get into something so again all these topics i'm not double clicking into it i'm just going to the depth like as much as i can and then just trying to be shallow maybe you will see me giving future talks double clicking on each of these things right so that's more around the css and js and don't forget to add some story books and then add a vrt vrt how many of you are using like visual regression tests something like chromatic or something now worry try it out man like say let's consider everybody like now in a company will be having like some design system if not at least a shared components folder so add your story books there create a vrt pipeline like a visual regression test pipeline say for example i may i can make like some changes in some page like one particular route of a react app no issues it's going to break my my own things like say for example i am making some user page in the user page i am making some change it's going to make problems only to my user module all right if i make something some changes some css changes some addition of margin or something in the components think of i'm doing some random shit i'm not testing it properly go use into the production and there we find out that entire app is like looking very weird with just one small margin bottom change this can happen right so basically vrts are super helpful make sure that you are adding visual regression tests something like chromatic this is easy to set up and things and yeah who oh, this is some hateful stuff right like how many of you hate these things <laughs> you need this man like bro seriously <laughs> uh me writing code will take 2 hours you need this i don't know man like <laughs> okay so keeping jokes aside like you need this is important obviously we need to write but one of the projects like say i work for this company called rubric so the application is like present in one mono repo and uh, entire code is present in the mono repo so basically what happens is it's a ton of files it's pretty big project rubric is a big company and the product by itself is very vast and uh, the files are like you can imagine like thousands of files or 10000s of files kind of and uh, for each and every test run it is like for each and every commit we run all the unit tests and it took at least like one and a half an hour for each and every sale one commit you do one and a half an hour for sure you need to wait just for the pipelines to complete like unit test to pass in say like everything is thorough and if some unit tests are failing you need to fix it and then send it again like it's a whole lot of headache man so the problem is we were using just so and again we try to upgrade the node at the same time so what happens is with the node upgrades like 20 20 plus just is like super painful man like it's it's becoming slower and slower we test is cooler with the same kind of apis but it's still pretty much immature reason being there is not like a lot of tooling around that say for example just may we had the 
<coughs> tooling on something called GraphQL mocks. So GraphQL, if you get into that, that is even a separate topic altogether. There is GraphQL mocking, uh, which needs to happen for each and every endpoint, even though I am not explicitly mocking from the consumer end, uh, so that the, all the components are working as if it is getting the data. And only the component that I'm, I want to mock, I will mock it. That's the kind of thing. So to do that, we use some library called GraphQL mocking, which supports just and not V test. So it's pretty much immature, slowly it's growing, like uh, wait for it to grow, but V test is cooler, man. Like if I am doing create react app today, I will go with V test for sure. I, I will try to figure out ways so that I can stick with V test. So V test again, I don't know how many of you know, like it's from this V community. Uh, they came up with this similar uh, APIs like IT, describe, same mocking, same similar. That's pretty much it. Uh, <clears throat> that's with that. And coming back to the builds and bundlers, I'm not going so much into the transpilers and things. I'm just sticking with the uh, bundlers. Uh, bundlers, Wheat, ESBuild, Webpack. Wheat internally uses ESBuild for many things. ESBuild is written in Golang and Rust. And Webpack is slower with Node.js and things. Uh, this is cooler, man. Go with Wheat. Uh, again, ESBuild is like raw, little raw. V test is sophisticated. You get a lot of features on top. So stick with V test. Sorry, V stick with V and it's super cool. Like only thing that you need to keep in mind is like I will take it from my previous company's example only, where the app is so big and uh, in the dev server they just support HTTP one. So when you up the server, it is like blink. Like Webpack will. I need to run it. Wait for five minutes. Take a grab a cup of coffee and then come back. It will still be running. It will still be building. And still the dev server is not up for such big applications. And after that, like, uh, ha, like HMR is like working fine, but still like the first initial load will be so high, the time, the latency. So with V that is reduced, but the problem is like for, this is native ES models, which will be transported to your browser with V. So it's a ton of JavaScript files, which is going to transport to your, uh, browser instead of just the bundles with the beat. So when you have a lot of files transporting to the browser, ultimately there is a problem, right? Like, and it's all HTTP one. And I don't know, again, some oldies will remember that uh, old uh, <laughs> era where we were doing some domain sharding and things like that, just to avoid this concurrent request, uh, threshold, breach and all these things. So this is a similar problem. Everything is served from one URL, localhost 3000 or something. And then you need to wait for it to load in the browser. That might take some more time if the bundles are higher in size. That's the only problem, but otherwise I think they are also moving to HTTP 2 or something with the HTTP 2 or 3 uh, with the dev server, which should hopefully fix the issue. I think the PR is also out. It's just not merged because of some issues. Uh, you can check the Wheat community, find it out. Pretty easy. The next one is the build systems, man. Like, say, I don't know uh, how many of you are already using the, something of this sort. NX, Turbo Repo, Basil Buck. Basil Buck, I know a lot of people would have not used it. Uh, NX and Turbo Repo, I know probably like it will take care of the integration test, run it, like bundle it, publish the packages, and then do things. Turbo Repo is similar. Turbo Repo is written on, again, the similar of this weed thing, right? Like, it is written in, the NX is written in Node.js. It sucks. And then Turbo Repo is written in like Golang and Rust, uh, takes the advantage of fast and uh, does the same thing. Bazel and Buck, I would prefer. Basically, it's my personal opinion. Reason being like, I have worked so far like in some bigger applications. Like I, the first company I worked, LeechCoid, it's like we worked on multiple smaller applications, but still like, uh, uh, major of my experiences are some scaled applications where like I need to make sure like backend, frontend, both are in conjunction. Nothing is breaking, mission critical. If you break and something is going to happen, you need to meet your manager in your next one-on-one. -on -one. I don't want to do that. So <clears throat> Bazel and Buck are cool. Reason being it gives like single, single, uh, you will have one single build system, which will build your backend, frontend, all the other components in your things. So Bazel, again, it's like so the same KGF dialogue, right? Powerful people comes from 
powerful places. Bazel is from Google. So just try it out. It's uh, written in some language called Starlack. Uh, that is a learning curve, but once you learn the features it gives, like sandboxing and things like cool man, like Bazel. Bug2 is faster than Bazel. It's a community driven thing. Bug2, I will go with Bug2 if I'm doing it now for my own project. So again, check it out. Like I cannot get into the details of this. It's already time. But uh, this nx.dev, this is a blog. Uh, they have <laughs> ranted out, I would say, uh, what they can give apart from Turbo Repo. Check it out. Like uh, if you are deciding between nx and Turbo Repo. And uh, yeah, I mean, like a lot of content in single slide, but yeah, I will just go on. Uh, package manager, uh, NPM, how many people are using? Yarn. Cool. Some hands. PNPM? Seriously, man. Like, less people. Go with that. PNPM is like going to be a lifesaver. NPM, you do NPM install, sit there for so much time. You will like wait for it and then resolution and then like module, node modules is going to be heavier than like what not, man. <laughs> like, it's going to be heavier than the planets in the uh, solar system also. So that's how heavy the node module sizes are. And you, if you're having 500 GB of hard disks, 300 GB is going to go back just with the node module if you're using NPM. And if you are using PNPM, it's cooler. It does all the sim links, takes care, like there is only one copy of one bundle, one package of that particular version, takes care of all these things. And it's a lifesaver, man. Cool, blink it, and then it's like done. PNPM install. It's completed. NPM install takes time, sucks. Uh, Yarn is like, again, next variant of uh, NPM, but still doesn't compete with PNPM. PNPM is lightning fast. And uh, <clears throat> it's a very sim similar man. Like, if you are looking for a promo in your next appraisal cycle, it's a good one. Just, just go update from NPM to PNPM. Say that your PNPM, like, the install time has like, reduced so much. Add it to your OP doc, done. Probably you might get promoted. Probably not also. <laughs> Dependency audit. So it's no, it's no low time uh, to use this package manager audit, man. That's like stupid, super stupid. Like what happens is uh, package, you know why I have put this audit as main thing? Like, you know, a lot of breach where it is happening, right? Like say, what happens is, I think I have given a big story around it in previous of my talks, but simple like small story around it is like I can publish any package if I have your credentials if you are an open source contributor who have published your npm package already in the npm js okay if I have your credentials I can publish anything I want and what happens when you do npm install you didn't use the exact version and you have that uh, cap thing mm, upgrade will take my own code into your local system I can get whatever I want from your local system because of node.js vulnerabilities so there is a talk which I have given, so just check it out if you want to know more about it. So this package manager audit, how it's going to work is like it will wait for all these vulnerabilities to be discovered uh, by the community and then they will add it to the package, some JSON file and then like uh, from there it will do that audit, which is not like a very cool thing. Socket.dev is cooler, man. Just check it out. That project is like really cool. There is some pricing, but it is worth it, I would say. Like it goes through each and every uh, open source code that you're downloading into your system. Check if there is any obfuscated code and things. Hosting, uh, I would go with CDN uh, hands down for anything else. Unless until if there is any security reasons and things like that. Say, for example, like uh, in rubric again, one of the example is like <clears throat> there are a lot of situations we need to think like where there is no internet. So in that case, the CDNs cannot work. So we need to go with something like Nginx or something. But otherwise, I would stick to CDN in most of the cases. My current company one knows like we would prefer to uh, go with CDN and things, but we need some server side rendering and things. So we are sticking with the next ten. Uh, and CSPs, content security policies. I don't know how many of you have it in your apps. For sure, you need to have a CSP. Have it. And must do is try this Dom Dog. It's a cool scanner they have, free of cost. Check it out. That is also cool stuff. One minute things, and if you are finding out some cool uh, vulnerabilities and things, it can become a bounty for your promo. Check it out. And uh, Lint and Prettier, set it up if you are doing for sure. 
just use some Airbnb boilerplate or something which is available there in the open source, static code analysis, set up Sonar Cube, make sure your coverage is running properly at a certain threshold and things. Performance monitoring, again, go with Sentry for real-time data, cooler. Uh, there is like Datadog which is coming nearby, but I would prefer Sentry because I'm a UI engineer. I was a UI engineer, now I'm writing some backend, things like that. It's confusing, but yeah. So uh, Sentry is one cool stuff for UI engineers. Uh, if your company want to pay only one software, then maybe Datadog, basically it can take front-end data as well as the backend data. Sentry can also take backend data, but its expertise or good things are more around the front-end data. So for front-end, go with Sentry if you have the budget. And then Lighthouse for Synthetic. Lighthouse is a common tool. Having it in Chrome, you can just easily get the synthetic data, metrics and things. And debugging plugins, obviously Chrome debugger is like the coolest stuff. Uh, apart from that, some Chrome plugins which can help are like React DevTools, Apollo, uh, gRPC dev tools if you are using gRPC and like requestly if you are just sticking with the REST APIs, morely that. And metrics, mix panel or amplitude, these are more around user adaptability metrics. Both are same, similar, just if you are able to convince anybody of the team. So basically you can talk to the sales team, uh, bargain or do something and then get your budget down. So if you are, whatever the budget is lesser for you, like go with it. And again, depends on your company's uh, purchase and things. So basically, both are similar, features are the same, and things are good. Like, both works, both are good. So whichever is cheaper, go with it. And uh, last but not the least, this is like, I'm not going to take so much time. I am a guy, uh, UI engineer, who writes accessible code. I don't write a single line of code which is not accessible. That's for me, my morale to be inclusive by myself. Like, I, whatever I am building, it should be inclusive. So write accessible code, make sure like, this Arc browser is a cool thing. Like, I don't know if you would have used it similar to Chrome, but a lot of usability feature improvements and things are there. But what is more interesting for me as an engineer who is focused on accessibility is their dev tools for accessibility. You can see read through color contrast checker, ARIA checker. It will just let you know, like, do you need to add the ARIA labels here, there, what not. So cool stuff. And uh, there are some experiments which are yet to ring the bell, which, which I feel like there are a lot of potential in the front end engineering to come up, which is like, there is one. I don't know how many of you know that. Uh, there is one runtime there the community has built. Uh, I am yet to check it out. I just checked it out once or twice. It is running the Node.js code, but it's not like, I don't know, I'm not able to measure it properly. But um, bun is runtime, bun's runtime is like much faster uh, given its rust or like implementation, SWC implementation. So that's, that's what they claim. Uh, we need to wait and see like if we can just replace the entire Node.js runtime with the bun runtime or something. And then WebAssembly, uh, there are a lot of issues with the performance and things still there, but still we are yet to like uh, <clears throat> get the potential out of it. Uh, CSS Houdini, I don't know how many of you heard it, like 10 years back, like it was one of the coolest of magic coming into the industry, but it was dropped. Now again, it's picking up, the projects are cooler. Just check out what is Houdini, try to build some CSS Houdini, like cool stuff. Like you can do a lot of things. You can like say how margin top is there. It's one of the CSS attribute. You can create your own things and set the behavior for it through Houdini. So like you can just say Santosh margin and then like say give a different uh, definition for it altogether. So cool stuff. Again, if it is necessary, we can use it. So that's the kind of things. So that's mostly it. Uh, thank you so much, guys. What I will take a minute to explain, like, uh, my company, like, One House, Good Money. We are at Series B, US startup. Uh, definitely just check out the jobs roles there. Yeah, thank you so much.